Uh, he's our everything. And uh, so, Michael, you can go ahead and begin that countdown for me. But I'd like us to open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, chapter 2. And it talks about the birth of Jesus. And what I want to talk about this afternoon for just a little, just a little while is the wise kings, the magi, the astrologers, the three men of Orientar who came from the east. They were Gentiles. They were not of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet they came from afar. And they came to worship the king of kings and lord of lords. And I think it's very important that we get a glimpse of the faith that was in their heart because the faith that motivated, that compelled, that drove, that caused them to come that distance is the same faith that should cause us to do the will of God. You see, they said they came to worship him. And the word worship reveals that they fell at his feet. Now, they fell at the feet of an infant, and that's what it tells us in the book of, of Matthew chapter 2 and if you look here in verse 10 and when they saw the star they rejoiced with exceeding great joy in the book of Peter it says that yet believing we rejoice with joy though we've never seen them yet believing we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory when faith is alive when faith is active when faith is moving and working in your heart it will cause there to be exceeding great joy and uh, maybe I can get all the parishioners to move to the very center here for I can look at them. <laughs> Could y'all move right to the center? Praise the Lord. And uh, I'm so glad to have you all here with us today and also those who are watching by internet because I'm speaking directly to the camera. But anyways, it says that our hearts will be filled with exceeding great joy when, when we see Jesus. Amen? Now, we don't have to wait to heaven to get to see Jesus. You can see Jesus right now by faith. As you pick up your Bible and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read the epistles, and even in the Old Covenant, when you read the book of Isaiah, and when you be, read the book of Ezekiel, and you begin to read, even in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when it says that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the snake or the serpent, which is the devil, you can have exceeding great joy. See, I, I'm looking for the day when I can look my Savior face to face, when I can look deep into his beautiful eyes and I can fall at his feet and worship him because he is worthy. See, this is the reality that we need to get a hold of, that God is worthy and that God deserves every part of our life, every part of our existence, every thought, every desire, every attitude, every emotion, every step that we take is because Jesus deserves it. He is worthy of it. And that's why these wise men, these astrologers, these magi, these kings from the Orient are traveled so far because they saw that he was worthy. They had a revelation of who Jesus was. They had a revelation who this child was because they said, we have seen his star in the east, they told Herod, and we have come to worship him. And remember when Jesus went to the well that day and he was speaking to a woman of Samaria who had been married five times and I'm living with a man. And, began, and she said, we worship God in these hills. And he said, you don't know who you worship. He said, the day will come when you will worship him in spirit and in truth. <coughs> See, we got to worship God in spirit and in truth. We got to worship him from the depths of our heart we got to worship him from the reality of faith in our life that we believe that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. We need to have faith. Say to somebody, I need to have faith. See, we need to have faith in Christ Jesus. We don't have confidence in ourselves. We have no trust in ourselves, but these men, there must have been something in these men's hearts that caused them to respond to the wooing of the spirit of the Father. Because no man can come unless the Father draws him. And so these men, these Gentiles, these heathen, these, these foreign 
kings were touched by God, and when God touched them, they responded. I believe with all my heart right now while I'm speaking to you, as I'm ministering, as I'm declaring the truth that the Spirit of God is touching you, He is speaking to you, He is drawing you, but He will not take away your power of choice. You can choose if you want to respond. You can choose if you want to surrender. You can choose if you want to give. You can choose if you want to go all the way, or you can be lukewarm lackadaisical, non-responsive, I choose by the Spirit of God to respond. So these wise men, these magi, these, these men from the Orient are, and wise men still seek him, they responded. Now when they responded, they said, yes, Lord, they had a revelation of what was about to happen. They had a revelation of who had come into the earth. They had a revelation that this baby that was born, and literally, I believe that star did not come into existence. Matter of fact, we don't know when the star came into existence. We don't know. It's when Mary conceived the seed of the word or after she gave birth. We do know that Herod killed all the children from two years old and down, and that he inquired diligently of the Magi when the star had appeared. And so he went in and he slaughtered all of the male children. Why? Why would the devil slaughter all of the male children? Because this Jesus is an absolute threat to all the devil stands for. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Let me tell you something. The devil had humanity by the throat. He, humanity, there was nothing he could do to get free, but there was a promise of the seed of the woman that would come to crush the head of the snake, and that's what Jesus came to do. And so because Jesus was such a threat to the devil's power, he had to do what he did. Let me tell you something. The reason why the name of Jesus is being forbidden to be spoken in the public arena, in the public schools, in the government buildings, in the highways and the byways, is because he is a threat to the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of this age, the spirit of the devil. He is a threat to everything that the devil stands for. And therefore, he has got to destroy him. Now, that seed of Christ has been planted in our hearts. We have been impregnated by the Holy Ghost, by the Word of God. That Jesus lives in us, and we are giving birth to that Jesus. You know, sometimes you can tell how close somebody is to giving birth to a child by the size of their belly. And isn't it, and isn't it amazing? Because the Bible says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Did you ever think about the fact of the matter? Because <laughs> I've had the privilege of seeing our children born. And isn't it amazing, whenever a child is about to be born, there is a river of water that flows out of the belly. <laughs> and that is a giving birth to Christ. I'm telling you, before we give birth to Christ, there will be a breaking, there will be a flooding, there will be an outpouring of the water of God in our hearts, in our lives, in our mouths, before we give birth to the manifestation of Jesus in the earth, there will be a flood of water. <laughs> and you can tell how pregnant a woman is by the size of her belly. I want you to know you can tell how close you are to giving birth to Jesus, I believe, by the joy in your heart. It says that these men were filled with exceeding joy. Now, why were they filled with exceeding joy? Because the lover of their soul, the one they've been seeking for, the one they've been hunting for, the one they've been in pursuit of for the last two years was right there. They saw his star. They saw the light hanging over the house where Mary and Joseph and the little child Jesus were dwelling. And when they came in, it tells us, and this is amazing, and when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. They fell down. I, I mean, it doesn't say they slowly got down upon their knees because their backs were so stiff from riding the camels for two years. Now, can you imagine? I'm telling you what, you know what? I've driven on a motorcycle for an hour, and I could hardly walk when I got off it. Have you ever driven a car for two days? 
or one day you're headed out to California somewhere and you were in the car for maybe 20 hours and, and, and every time you got out of the car, you walked around like a cripple and you said, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I mean, you're believing God that your back is healed, your knees are healed, your legs are healed. Now, can you imagine on the back of a camel, a flea-bitten, long-eared, stinking, no-good camel, and you're out there for two years. Two years on the back of a camel. I mean, can you imagine how stiff you were? Can you imagine? So here they got off of their camels. And I'm sure they're kind of, just kind of, kind of walking up like cripples up to the door. They go into the house, and there Jesus is. And they didn't get down on their knees slowly. They fell to their faces. What would, you know, a lot of times in services, we'll watch people fall. You know why? Because they're falling before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, when you stand before a king, I'm talking about in the old days, and maybe even still in some of the nations of the world, when you came before a king, you didn't keep standing. That was disrespectful. You would literally throw yourself on your face in front of that king. You know, that's why when they came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, who do you look for? And they said, we are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said this, he said, I am. And the minute he said, I am, the Bible says that all of those soldiers, including Judas, including the Pharisees, fell backwards. They could not stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, that's why when sometimes the Spirit of God is moving in a wonderful way in a particular meeting, nobody can stand upon their feet. I remember I was in one service and I was preaching in a church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the power of God came rushing in, and everybody fell on their face, including men, women, and children, and nobody could say a word. They could not even whisper. They did not make any noise for two and a half hours. Why? Because the king of kings and the Lord of lords had stepped into that building. So now here these wise men are. They come before this little infant child, and they recognize him for who he is. He is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel. He is the king of kings. And they fall on their face, and they worship him. <laughs> they worship him. Why? Because he is worthy. See, the sufferings, the pain, the agony, the self-denial, the cold winter nights, the wet days, the, the pains in their body, the, 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 the danger of thieves and, and of wild animals and of, of, of winter storms and of, of, of hurricanes and tornadoes. Who knows what these men went through for two years? For two years they've been traveling to get to Jesus. Two years they've been traveling on the back of a camel to get to Jesus and people can't even get into their car Sunday morning to drive a half an hour to come and worship the king. But I believe those times are about to change. I truly believe with all my heart that we're on the edge of a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe that we will be seeing people who are going to be getting on boats and in cars, and in trains, and in planes, and they're going to be coming from all around the world because they want to come, and they want to experience this, this Jesus. They want to be touched. They want to worship. They want to, I know they can be touched of God where they're, they're, they're at, but, you know, there's something. There's, there's times when God just shows up somewhere. Just, God just reveals himself somewhere. It's just there's, there's an appointed time and there's an appointed place and there are places like Jesus, he was called to be given birth to in Bethlehem. It was prophesied he would be given birth to in Bethlehem. Now why couldn't she just give birth in Nazareth? I don't know. Why couldn't he, she had just given birth uh, uh, in a hotel? I don't know. He had to be born in that little stinky manger, in that cold, stinky manger on a cold night in, in a little place called Bethlehem. That was a, an obscure little village. I don't know why he had to be born there, but he was. I, I don't know why. God, God knew before the foundations of the world 
where he was going to move, where he was going to reveal. Where, like, like, for instance, way back when, when the Azusa Street Revival, when God showed up in, a, in an old church that had been converted into a barn and then converted back to a church and it had a dirt floor and, and, and there was nothing in that building. And, 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 and an old black preacher by the name of Brother Seymour who was blind to one eye, he would go into that building and he would take a basket and he would literally take the basket and he would preach. This is what Brother Seymour did. Brother Seymour would stand up and he'd put a basket over his head. And Brother Seymour, by the Spirit of God, would begin to preach. And as he would preach, he'd be preaching with his head in the basket. And he preached with his head in the basket because he said he did not want anybody to see him. He didn't want anybody to know it was him. He wanted everybody to see it was Jesus Christ, that it was not him, but it was Christ in him. And that when the Spirit of God would move, when the Spirit of God would touch, when the Spirit of God would heal, it was not because of Brother Seymour, but it was because Jesus Christ had showed up to deliver, to heal, and to set men free. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. They worshipped him. They worshipped him. See, God is looking for those who will worship him in the spirit and truth. God is looking for those who want him more than anything else. God is looking for those who say, Jesus, all I want is your will to be accomplished in my life. Here am I, send me. God is looking for those who want to go all the way, 100%. And when they had opened their treasures, see, God's given you a treasure. I don't know what it is, the treasure of your heart, the treasure of your mind, the treasure of your, your, your voice. Maybe God has gifted you with a singing ability, or, or maybe he's given you a personality that is just outgoing. And, and God's, whatever God has given to you, whatever God has blessed you with, whatever God has, 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 has placed within the, the vessel of your being, you need to open it up. And you need to give it to him. Maybe it's a shout. Maybe, maybe it's a laugh. Maybe it's a dance. Maybe it's a smile. I don't know what it is, but God has given you something that he wants you to give to him. And they took this treasure and they presented it to Jesus. Now, now you know, you think about this. He, he, he was a young boy. I don't know how old he, he had to be less than two years old or up to two years old. I don't even think he was two years old. And he, he, they laid it at his feet. I wonder what was going through the mind of the little boy Jesus, the little child Jesus. I, I, I had to be lovely. It had to be pure. It had to be honest. It had to be good because he never thought a thought that was not of his father. But he accepted their gifts. And what they lay at his feet, they gave to him their best gifts. Well, why do people wait to their old age to give God their lives? We ought to give God our lives from the time that we can think up until the time we die. We ought to give God our best gifts. Give him your best years. Give him your best. You know, a lot of times, let's be honest, people spend the majority of their best years fulfilling the lust of their flesh. Whatever my flesh wants, it wants a new house, it wants a new car, it wants an expensive watch, it wants an expensive ring, it wants this, it wants that, it wants a vacation on, on, on going to the Bahamas, and they just give their flesh whatever it wants. Why don't we give Jesus the best? Why don't we just maybe deny our flesh and say, listen to me, body, the day's going to come when you're going to be transformed. You will be, you will be made of eternal substance. But until that time, you shut up and sit down and be quiet. Because you're not running this show. 
Flesh, you're not telling me what to do. You're not telling me if I could go to church or I can't, or if I can pray or I can't, or if I can read my Bible and I can't, or if I can do God's will or I can't, or I can share the truth or I can't. I'm going to do God's will. Body, shut up. Body, be quiet. I think that's what Brother Seymour was doing when he put that basket over his head. I really do. I believe what he was doing. He put that basket over his head and he said, shut up. He told his body to shut up. I know you want to be seen. I know you want to be recognized. I know you want to be praised. I know you want to feel like you're exalted. I know you want to be somebody. I know you come from a very obscure background and you're blind to one eye and you think that you should really get the love and the attention that you never got when you were a child, but body, shut up. They don't need to see my face. They don't need to have their eyes on me. They need to get their eyes on Jesus Christ. So body, just shut up. I believe that Brother Seymour was giving the best he had by covering his face. I believe he was doing everybody a favor by covering his face. He was giving his best to Jesus. We need to give our best to Jesus. You know, see, when, when these three wise men showed up, when they came to Jesus, we don't even know their names. They, they said, instead of saying, who's that masked man? They would say, who's that man with a basket on his head? Somebody's watching right now, and if they don't know who I am, they're going to say, well, who's that man? standing in the camera with a basket on his head. And they're probably saying, well, who is that basket-covered man? But it does not matter. It doesn't matter the face under the basket. It doesn't matter the head under the basket. All that matters is Jesus is Lord. And so these three wise men show up, and they don't even give us their name. Now, somebody came up with names for these three men. Somebody gave us a name for all these three men, but we don't know what their names were. Because it doesn't matter what their names were. It doesn't matter how wealthy they were, how educated they were, how old they were, what kind of camel they drove, what kind of clothes, clothes they wear. It doesn't matter because it wasn't about these three wise men. It was about the one they came to worship. It was about the one they came to love. It was about the one they came to serve. It was about the one they came to give their best to. They gave their best to Jesus. Because Jesus deserved their best. He was worthy of the gold. He was worthy of the frankincense. He was worthy of the myrrh. He was worthy. And they fell at his feet, these three grown, wise men, kings, magi, astrologers that had driven and had rode on the back of donkeys or, or horses or camels for two years. For two years. And now they fell at the feet of Jesus. And we don't even know who they were. Because it doesn't matter who they were. See, it doesn't really matter who's underneath the basket. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is who is Jesus. Maybe this is the way that we should be preaching. Maybe we all should be preaching with a basket over our head for they cannot see who we are. Because we want them to see Jesus. We want them to fall at their feet. We want them to fall at the feet of Jesus and give, give Jesus their gold and their frankincense and myrrh. Give Jesus your best. Give Jesus your all. Now, once they got done doing this, they had done their part. They had fulfilled their commission. They had fulfilled what God had called them to do. And they got back on their camels and they had heard from heaven and told them not to go see Herod because Herod was out for the destruction of Jesus. I'm telling you, the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age, they are out for the destruction of Jesus. And so these three wise men, 
They got on their camel and they drove off and they, they, they rode up into the sunset with nobody knowing who they were. Nobody knew their names. Nobody, everybody just knew they came from the east. They didn't know the towns or the cities or the villages. They didn't know the names of their fathers or the descendants or their kingdoms because all that mattered in this particular historical account, all the Spirit of God lets us see is not who these men are, but it shows us who Jesus is because they said we have come to worship the King of Kings. We have come to find the King of Israel. We've come to see the Messiah, the Savior of the human race. They did not come to be seen. They didn't even come to be heard. They came to express their love and their devotion by laying at the feet of Jesus the best that they had. I think it's time for all of us to put a basket over our heads and to tell people it's not about me, it's about the Lord. We need to give Jesus the best. We need to give Jesus our all. We need to put him first in everything we do. It's hard not to laugh with you ladies. But you know, as Brother Seymour preached the gospel, the power of God would fall. Because he didn't preach with a basket, he preached with a box. I think it was a box he put over his head. And the power of God would fall. People would get healed, delivered, set free, because Brother Seymour, he knew in his heart that his flesh wanted to be seen. His flesh wanted to be something special. He wanted to be exalted. He wanted to be praised. He wanted to be acknowledged and recognized as being spiritual. So he said to his body, he said, body, shut up. You know, these wise men, see, wise men, wise men will tell their bodies to shut up. Wise men will not ask their bodies their opinion. Wise men will not say, what well, do you want to pray today? Do you want to read your Bible today? Do you want to really pay tithes? Do you really want to go to church? Do you really, do you really, do you really? No, you just, I don't care what my body wants. I can guarantee when he went to put that box on his head the very first time, his body was probably screaming at him, don't cover me up, don't hide me, I want to be seen, I want to be recognized, I want to be somebody. And Brother Seymour said, shut up, I'm putting a box over your head, you ugly thing, you, because you're not going to become somebody famous. You know, after the Zuzu Street Revival, we never heard, never heard about Brother Seymour again. When these men of God... I said they were men of God. When they rode away on their camels, on their donkeys, or on their horses, we never heard from them again. They never published a book. They never talked about their experience. They never went around and held conferences, letting everybody know how awesome they were. No, they did what God called them to do. They had fulfilled their part. You know, that's what we need to do. We, we don't need to be trying to find some way to recognize ourselves. But we, you know, a lot of times when revival comes, and I truly, truly believe with all my heart that we are already in the midst of revival. I really believe that God is already moving, that God is already speaking, that God is already healing. I mean, we're having some amazing miracles here. I mean, we just had a precious lady who was here this morning that three weeks ago she walked in with a cast with a broken wrist. And by the 2 o'clock service, her wrist was so healed she took the cast off and she could not even tell she had a broken wrist. I mean, we have seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet I believe it's just what we would call a, 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 just a, the tip of the iceberg. I, I believe we're about to see God. I believe we're about to see God do some awesome things. Awesome things. But what we got to do is we got to really pursue him. We got to be like these wise men. They gave their all. They gave their best. They gave their everything. They said we will pay the price. We will run the race. It doesn't matter if it takes us two years or ten years. It doesn't matter how long it's going to take us. It doesn't matter what we got to go through. It doesn't matter what we are going to have to suffer. It doesn't matter what we are going to lose. It doesn't matter what we are going to give. We're going to give our, our, him our best. I, I truly believe that probably when they gave their gold, frankincense, and myrrh, probably on the way to discover Jesus in person, See, I want people to discover Jesus in person. I, I don't want them ju just to see Jesus in me. See, that, that's not good enough. They need to experience this Jesus. 
I want them to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Having a face-to-face -face encounter with me. I mean, if you come up and you have a face-to-face -face encounter with me, you might walk away going, oh, man, he has bad breath. God forbid, I hope that's not the case, but it could be. But I want you to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ. So when you meet Jesus face-to-face -face by his spirit, by his word, by his revelation, you walk away different. I'm totally convinced these men were already different than everybody else. But you know what? I believe that after they literally seen the Christ child, he didn't say a word to them. They just saw him. I believe their life was never the same. I believe that from that one experience until the day they died, they were never the same. You know, I've had experiences with Jesus where I'm never the same. I think we need to have an experience with Jesus every day of our life. I, now, Pastor Mike, are you telling me to seek an experience? No, but I'm telling you, you will have an experience. I'm telling you that if you seek Jesus with all of your heart, if you seek God with every fiber of your being, if you're willing to pay whatever price has to be paid to get a hold of God, like the woman with the issue of blood who pushed her way through the crowd, we don't know what her name was, but she is famous. We don't know, we don't know where she came from. We don't know exactly what she went through. All we do know is she spent all of her money and, and on physicians and she grew worse but, but worse. but she said, if I can but touch the hem of the garment of Jesus, I know I will be healed. She said, if I can just get my hands on Jesus, I'm telling you, that's what you got to have. You got to have that kind of faith. I just want to get my hands on Jesus. I just want to touch the hem of his garment. I just want to look in his face. I just, yeah, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I, need, I don't care what it's cost me. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care. Let me tell you something. If you have that kind of faith, if you have the faith of these wise men, and wise men still seek Christ, if you had the faith of these wise men, you will not be denied. You will not walk away disappointed. You will not walk away without your needs being met. If you decide to go after Jesus with all of the fiber of your being, with every cry of your heart, with every aspect of your existence, if you go after Jesus, you will discover this Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about just being born again here. I'm not talking about just speaking in tongues. I'm not talking about just prophesying. I'm telling you, there is experience after experience, revelation after revelation, glory after glory that you can experience in Christ. If God did not want us to physically, mentally, emotionally experience him, he would not have given us five senses. I have literally, physically experienced Jesus Christ. Some of you in this meeting today, you physically were experiencing Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know. He might have had you on your back and been tickling you. I don't know what he was doing, but he, you were experiencing him. He was touching you. That isn't the devil tickling you. That ain't the flesh tickling you. That's God touching you. That's God breathing on you. That's God moving on you. And if God has to do it by the preacher putting a basket on his head, then he can do that. You know, God used a donkey to turn aside the prophet, didn't he? Can't God do anything he wants? Why do we limit God? So God spoke to these wise men through a little baby, Christ Jesus, and they walked away transformed. You know what? I'm totally convinced. Up to that time, two years of traveling, pain, suffering, agony, being without their wives, without their children, not knowing what's happening to their kingdom, their businesses, not knowing what's happening to their family. I believe probably they were saying, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Was it worth it? And to the minute they looked upon Jesus, when they looked upon Jesus, something happened inside of their heart. When they looked upon Jesus, something took place inside of them. When they looked upon Jesus, they were never the same. I'll never be the same again, oh no. I'll never be the same again, oh no. <laughs> My life has been changed. I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same again. 
See, I'll never be the same again when Jesus touched me, when Jesus moved upon me, when Jesus spoke to me, when Jesus revealed himself to me, when Jesus healed me, when Jesus delivered me, when Jesus took away my speech impediment, when Jesus opened up my ears, when Jesus gave me an open vision, when Jesus took me to hell, and when Jesus took me to heaven, my life would never be the same. I am changed. I'll never be the same. Now we've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. We got love that flows like a river. We got peace that passes understanding. We have a new life for new people. We're new creations. We're the children of Almighty God. Our names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's coming for us. Christ is returning on the back of a white horse. And he's coming to take his beloved bride home. And what a day of rejoicing, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. I, I, I tell you, true Christianity is so mind-boggling. True Christianity is so wonderful. True Christianity is so powerful. True Christianity is so wonderful. I'm telling you what. If you'll give Jesus 100%, if you'll give him everything, every part of your existence, you will never be disappointed. You will be so glad. I'm convinced that these wise men, that as they laid everything they had at the feet of Jesus, they laid it all down at the feet of Jesus. I believe they were so glad they did it. They were so happy they did it. They were so filled with joy. I do not doubt one bit that if from that moment forward they were getting drunk in the spirit and they were laughing and shouting and clapping, I'm sure as they got in their donkeys, they were probably, or on their camels, they might have been so drunk in the spirit they were falling off of their camels like drunk men. I'm telling you, joy, unspeakable, because that's what it says, that yet having not seen him, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I can see these wise men who have looked upon Jesus, the one they've been looking for for two years. And as they walked out the door, and they were drunk in the Holy Ghost, they were laughing, they were shouting, they were so happy. And as they loaded up their camels and they began to head back home, I'm sure that all the way that from the time they seen Jesus to the time they got home, they were drunk in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you think, Pastor Mike, aren't you exaggerating? I, 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 do, not, I, I do not doubt it. <laughs> because when you see the real Jesus, you can't, you can't help but be happy. You can't help but shout. You can't help but be drunk. You can't help it because he, it's, it's, it's Christ that hope upholds all things. The Bible says that you are my beloved son. And he says, today have I begotten you. And he says, let all the angels of heaven worship you. Oh, what joy. What joy fills our soul when we begin to hold, behold the one who gave us all who gave his life, who took our sins, who took our sicknesses upon his back, who died and rose again. What joy floods our soul as we look upon Jesus, the one who saved us and rescued us, the one who delivered us. I like to read what it says here, what it says in the book of First Timothy and First Peter, whom having, listen, whom having not seen you love, and though, in whom though now you see him not, you see him not, yet believing, yet believing, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know what that means? That means you have so much joy you can't express it. You can't, you can't, you can't even tell somebody, I'm so happy. You can go ahead, try to tell someone, I'm so happy. I mean, you got so much joy, you can't even say, I'm so happy. I don't know about you, but I'm so happy I'm saved. I'm so happy I'm washed in the blood. I'm so happy I'm redeemed. I'm so happy my name is written down in heaven. My heart is filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because Christ died for me and rose again. Woo! Ho! 
wherein you greatly rejoice. It says, listen, this is so amazing. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Woo. I believe that's a revealing in this earth. Our salvation which will be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice. Though now for a season if need be you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love in whom though now you see him not yet believing yet believing yet believing yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall or should follow. We are, uh, we are the partakers of that salvation. We are the partakers of that grace. We are the partakers of that life. Now, as long as we've got our eyes on self, as long as we want people to see us, to recognize us, to think that we're something spiritual, that we're the cat's meow, that aren't we special, we will not experience the fullness of God's joy. We will not experience the fullness of God's life. We will not experience the fullness of God's blessings. That's why we, 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 we got to point to Jesus. We got to tell people, hey, don't look at me. I'm nobody. I'm nothing, man. You know, that's why I believe the Holy Ghost fell. At Azusa Street Revival. I, I, I've read stories. I don't know if you ever read a story about Azusa Street Revival, but, but literally what would happen, Brother Seymour would go into the church real early, and he'd find a pew up front, and other people would come, and worship would be going on, and he was sitting on a pew up front, and as he was sitting on a pew, he put the basket, basket over his head. He would put the box over his head, He would put the box over his head and he would sit there and he would pray. With the box over his head, he'd be praying and he'd be praying and he'd be praying. And when the worship got done, the, the, the music got done, he would perceive that it was time. And he would go up to the pulpit and he'd begin to preach with the box over his head. And as he preached, as he preached with the basket or the box over his head, the power of God would fall. And as he was preaching, people would be healed. People would be delivered. People would be set free. The devils would begin to come out. The power of God would begin to be manifested. Because he was pointing them to Jesus Christ. He did not want them to think he was something special or something abnormal or that he was somebody that God would use but that God is not a respecter of people and that he, God, will use anybody. He will use anybody if they will be surrendered and committed. It is time for us to be like those wise men. It is time for us to stop wanting people to look at us. It is time for us to go after Jesus with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, to be completely committed to Jesus Christ. (laughs) 
and to give Jesus 100%. Those wise men, they went, when they walked away, we don't know who they are. We don't know their names. We don't know their heritage. We don't know their kingdoms. We don't know their lineage. We don't know their education. We don't know even the color of their skins. We don't know their age. All we know is that they came. All we know is that they came and they gave everything to Jesus. We need to be like those three obscure wise men. Not trying to draw attention to self. Not trying to be somebody special. Not trying to get people to say, hey, look at me. Don't I have a pretty face? Ain't I somebody special? Look at me. What do you think of my hairdo? Isn't my hairdo just wonderful? Only my hairdresser knows. How about my makeup? What do you think about my how do you, what do you think about my earrings? Aren't them pretty earrings? Do you like the color of my lipstick? You know what? It's not what people think about your mug. They think about your face. It's the reality that you make Jesus the Lord of your life. And that he deserves. See, I don't deserve any of the praise. I don't deserve any of the worship. I don't deserve any of the honor. I don't deserve, it says, all glory and honor and power be unto him, the king of kings. I don't want none of the glory. I don't want none of the, the, none of the fame. I don't want none of the, uh, oh, aren't you something special? I want them to see Jesus. And if i got to preach with a basket on my head, I will. <laughs> Instead of people saying, who's that mask man? They'll say, who's that basket man? Because Jesus deserves, Jesus deserves our all. He deserves our everything. Can you give the Lord a hand clap and a shout? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's give him everything. Those wise men did. I want to be wise. How about you? Jesus gave him everything. I mean, Jesus gave us all our, everything he had, so we, we got to give him everything we have. Amen? 100%. 100%. Say 100%. Shout it, 100%. 100%. You know, that's the kind of preachers that we're looking for on this TV network. I believe that we're going to have men and women that believe in giving Jesus everything. And I'm not talking about giving everything for they can get their hands on it. I'm not talking about the preachers getting anything. My privilege is to give everything I have to Christ. That's our privilege. What a privilege. What a privilege. Year, years ago, when, uh, when uh, Kuwait was invaded by Iraq, uh, Hussein had invaded Iraq. The value of their dinar was $3.50 per <clears throat> American money, one dinar. When they got invaded, their money was worth nothing for years. And they began to reprint their money, and there's people who got wind of this. They said, well, this money is going to have to RV, revalue. So they began to buy up a, a lot of this Kuwait dinar. This went on, I think... But it looked like it was a bad investment. And uh, for six years, it just looked like the money wasn't even, the, 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 the money wasn't even worth the paper it was printed on. But one day, it RV'd. They revalued it at $1.60. People began to buy it up. And it went up to over $6 per dinar. 
or six, and then it came back down, I think it was about 350 now. Now all those people who invested in what looked like it had no value at that time became extremely wealthy overnight. Listen, let me tell you, that is nothing compared to your investment into the work of God. Because right now, nobody, it seems, willing to invest into telling people the reality of what God wants from them. But overnight, God's going to RV his currency. It's going to revalue. And it ain't going to be worth no $6.50 per God's dinar. It's going to be billions. He said to, remember he said to the man who had five pounds, the man took the five pounds and he invested it into God's work. And he stood before his master and God said, the master said, you know what? Because he said this five pounds which you gave me is now ten pounds. And this is what the master said. Because you were faithful over five pounds, I'm going to give you ten cities. Ten. Five dollars, he increased it to ten. Now, how many cities can you buy with ten dollars? What can you buy with ten dollars? Nothing. You can't. I mean, you can go to Hosses and, 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 and have a, a soup and salad bar with a sandwich. Ten dollars? But now he said, I'm going to give you ten. And these were celestial cities. No city in this earth has the wealth and beauty of a celestial city. God does not exaggerate. That was not an exaggeration. That was a declaration of an RV that's about to happen. And that's why Jesus said, don't store up your treasures. People are saving all their money in savings accounts, and they're putting their money in this, in this 401k, and putting their money in this. Let me tell you something. They are missing such an opportunity because you can just take $5 and get five cities. Wow. It's not that we really want this stuff, but, God, but Father knows best. If the Father says, if you're faithful over what I gave you, you double it, I'm going to double everything I'm going to give you in heaven. But then it says those who hid their money in this world, they kept it here. They poured it in here. He said, take what they do have, give it to the ones who already do have, and cast them into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, these three wise men were wise. They took their wealth. They put it at the feet of Jesus. And then it was no longer their business. They turned around, got on their camels, and went back home. So let's do that. I'm not saying ride a camel at home. But let's do that. Let's, let's just give our best to God, pour our life into the things of the kingdom, and when God calls us home, we're going to go, man, I am so glad I listened to the word of God. Amen. Well, if you got something, give the Lord a hand clap and a shout.